So just a, a few questions uh, for the group before I ask you specific questions. Often the first step in getting a manuscript published is uh, finding a writing agent. Could you each describe how you found your agent and then what that relationship is currently like? Oh my gosh, I've been with my agent for so long. Um, so typically, this is how it works. You write a book and you have to write it in its entirety if you're planning on writing a novel or something, you know, a fictional work. And then you search the internet for agents um, that might be looking for something that you have written. So for example, my agent was on a website. I don't even know what it's called. I think it's defunct now, but it, it she had she was a new agent and she had posted a wish list of different stories she likes to read and represent. So I saw that she liked um, psychological thrillers, lyrical writing, dark fantasy, which is kind of my genre. So I sent her a query letter, which is a one page uh, document you use to sell uh, your book basically. And you kind of it kind of reads like the back of a book jacket. So you've got to really catch their interest and tell them about you and your book. And then she requested the first half of it only and read it. And then I was stalking her on Twitter. And I saw late one evening, she was tweeting, I have to get the second half of this book. I'm so excited. And I was like, is it my book? You know, I was so excited. Um, and then I checked my email, and it was my book. So I sent her the second half. And then she called me um, a few days later to offer representation for that book in my career. Funny story, I actually had my son five weeks early. And she called me in my hospital room <laughs> to offer representation. And I didn't tell her I was in the hospital because I was like, she's going to think I'm never going to write a book again. I just had a baby. <laughs> so there's like doctors taking my blood pressure. And I'm like, yes, I would like to be represented by you. Um, but now we laugh about it. And I've been with her for you know six years now. And we have a great relationship. Um, she's my friend on top of my agent and is always willing to give me some good advice on my writing and some tough love, too. So. Um, I, I've been with my agent, Rosemary Stamola, since 2008, actually. Um, I, I went to uh, U of M for writing, for screenwriting, and I thought I was going to live in LA, I thought I was going to write movies for a living, and then I had my wisdom teeth taken out, and uh, my doctor broke my jaw, jaw in two places. So I, <laughs> I had, the entire summer, I, had, I was going to work on the, set, on the set of a movie that was filming in Ann Arbor, I had a whole thing going on. Um, and instead, I had nothing all of a sudden. I, could, you know, I couldn't eat. I couldn't do anything. Um, so I wrote this book instead. And I queried my agent. Um, and she got back to me the next day, asked for a partial. I sent it to her. Uh, the next day, she asked for the full. And then a couple days later, she, asked, uh, she offered representation. Um, and it was a great situation. Um, I've been with her, yeah, for 12 years now. And I feel like everybody's query story is this amazing aha moment, but honestly, I'd been querying for a good eight years before that with nothing. Um, I had one agent offer when I was 18, and um, immediately the next day she wrote to me and said that her boss didn't like my story and she had to rescind her offer, which was absolutely crushing at the time. And um, I, so while these stories are gonna be awesome and they're so exciting, it does take a while usually, and it's it's, it's a hardship. It's a slog to really get an agent. So, so I was, um, the first time I was trying to get an agent, I went on some online contests. And so um, they had a couple different ones going on, which I don't, they had Writer's Voice and some other ones that, that are no longer um, online anymore. And that's kind of how I got noticed a little bit and then I've had two agents so I had an agent um, that I had first and she ended up leaving the business so that was pretty heartbreaking um, however you know I supported her choice to leave and so we were um, querying a book that I had already not querying we were sending out a book that I had already written and so we had to pull that back <laughs> from some of the editors, and then I had to query again. So I kind of started again after having already had an agent. So that was definitely a unique experience, but it taught me a lot. And um, I'm really glad it happened because the second agent I have is the one I have currently, and we're really close. And she's super patient because I have a really demanding day job. And so um, I only write maybe a book a year 
if that. And so she's really patient with me. And I think that that's super important is your own pace that you go and make sure that your agent is cool with that. Um, because a lot of people churn out books, you know, more than me. Um, but she, she likes my writing, and so it works out. But yeah, so I've had two. Hopefully, just the two is where we'll, <laughs> we'll stop. Like a marriage, almost. I know. <laughs> it is kind of like a marriage. It really is. Yeah. I just wanted to say real quick. I think uh, being a lifelong Detroit Lion, Lions fan is like the best metaphor <laughs> for being in this business. Actually, <laughs> there's a lot of. It's uh, true. There's a lot of waiting <laughs> for the big win. Um, that may never come. That may never, that may never come. <laughs> we have secondary teams like the Chiefs. <laughs> right. 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 Um, so I, uh, I was a school teacher. I worked on my first book, Jumped In, for a few years and uh, had a lot of feedback from friends who were um, in theater and film and were into stories. So they helped me out a lot in teachers. Um, but I, I didn't really know about the next step, like how you take that next step. I learned about querying, and then um, I was in, uh, lived in Seattle, but I was in Palo Alto with my wife for a summer, and I was in the public library in Palo Alto, and I um, said, it's, I, I was working on my book, and I said, this is it, I'm done. I don't know what else to do on this book. So I um, said, I'm gonna query an agent. So I got up at the library, I went to the teen section of the library and said, I'm gonna like open the flaps of these books until I find the book that's the closest match to mine. And I'm gonna say, if an agent liked this book and liked this author, then I think they would like me. Smart. So I finally found the one book, picked that's it up, researched the author's agent, and in a week that guy was my my agent, he's Stephen Whoa. Chudney. He's just got a small. I didn't know it was only a week. A small, yeah. What? He offered super fast. Disclaimer: That's not normal. That's not normal. normal. <laughs> that's not a normal Months. story, and I feel like completely lucky. Um, that story could have gone this oh, way talented. too, where they're like, "Oh, I already have that author. I have yeah. you already. It's the person that wrote that book." Um, <laughs> so that I mean, and it, the person could have just said, "You're nowhere near that." <laughs> That I mean, it could have, that story could have gone a million different ways, and I got lucky. So I'm with a small kind of boutique no, uh, agent um, who he used to be in sales in uh, the publishing world, and decided to open up his own agency, and he um, does a nice job. We don't have a f uh, like friendship <laughs> per se. <laughs> he, we're cordial with each other, and it's like nice, lawyer, and he's a honestly. good person. Um, <laughs> So, uh, and he's not an editorial agent, but, um, but he knows how to sell my books, so. How many agents did you query? Was it just him? Well, yeah, at that time. <laughs> like, honestly, joking? honestly, way before, way before my book was ready, <laughs> I tried, I tried it, but I didn't really even have a, man. like it was like, it was, I don't really count it, but I did query some, People that Seriously? I never heard like back from. One and done. Hundreds. 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 Okay. I got lucky. I got lucky. Oh my God. You're lucky. talented. Wow. You didn't get so, to that point, Amy, um, having, <laughs> no, 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 having queried hundreds of agents, yeah. you're now on the other side. You're number one uh, best selling international author. Um, and writing is now your full time job. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the pressure of writing for a living? It seems glamorous. Boy, I can't. Um, I. Can you talk about what it's like? So, you have a room full of Googlers who, you know, maybe aspire to being a full time writer. What is it like when it is your job? Um, one of the things I tell people who want to become a full time writer is make sure you have another creative outlet. It took me a long time to learn this. Uh, writing has been my creative outlet since I was 10 years old. Um, I, I wrote every day. I've written almost every single day since I turned 10. Um, and I suddenly this was my job. And I had to write instead of chose to write. You know, I had to pay my bills. I had to feed my cats. I had to do all these things. Um, healthcare being what it is, I had all that. Um, and all of a sudden, it was all on me to perform. And the thing about writing is, even after you've sold, I've sold, I think, 15 books, 16. Um, even then, you can spend months and months and months working on a book that doesn't sell, or that your agent doesn't like, or that um, editors will fall in love with, but the rest of their publishing company isn't 
too into it, so you can't sell to them. Um, and you, you can, quote unquote, waste a lot of time in, in a full-time gig, and you don't have anything to fall back on. So it's very, very stressful. Um, and I've had uh, deadlines for two different books for two different contracts um, that are pushing up against each other. Um, for instance, I had two books due it on the exact same day at one point in my career. Um, and they were for two different companies, and I had to eventually tell one of them, you know, I, I'm sorry, I have to get a little bit more time. Um, but it's all on you to make a schedule. You don't really have anybody telling you, okay, this is what you have to do, this is what you have to do, this is what you have to do. Um, it is a lot of stress and pressure, and it's not for everybody. I do highly recommend that even if you make enough to, li to make it your full-time job, to also have a part-time job, not just for insurance benefits, but also to have something to go to and to have something to fill your days with. So it can be hard. And how, what do you do to, to make your schedule and to get your writing done, Amy? <laughs> So I wake up at noon most days. <laughs> um, it's actually true. Um, I write at night. Um, and what I have to do, and I've just started to implement this, is I write myself a checklist <laughs> of things to do. And I'm not a list maker. I'm very, very type B, kind of go with the flow. And um, so it, it was a really hard transition. I've been doing this for seven years now full time. And it's, you also have your friends to hold you accountable. Yes, yes, sorry. I'm sorry, I didn't know, I'm sorry, I didn't know what you meant, man. Um, yeah, Andrea and I will do, um, we definitely hold each other accountable every single day. And we'll text back and forth, and we'll do word sprints, which is um, we'll both sit down and write for 30 minutes straight and report back to each other at the end to see who wrote more. So. She always wins. But, you know, it's, at least something's getting done, right? Yeah. So, Every word on the page is important. It doesn't right. matter who wins. It's playing the game. It says the person who wins all the time, right? <laughs> so follow-up question for you, Andrew. You, uh, to Amy's point about not every book you write, how so you've been very open. And so for those of you who may not know, Andrea writes newsletters, and she's very uh, prolific in trying to help uh, a creative audience bring out their best creative selves. So in the new, in your newsletters and your retreats, you're very open that you've not always sold all of your books. How do you think about um, what that that's like with a book that doesn't sell? Do you shelve it and think about perhaps updating it, selling it later? What's your thought on self-publishing? And what is that yeah. emotional journey when you put all of this energy into writing something that doesn't sell? It's like that's like a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. All right. So let's start. I'll start with a story that happened to me two weeks ago. So um, I had this laptop. I've had it for five years. I've got, stored all my old books that I've written on it, and it just randomly died on a Tuesday. And I had to take it to the Apple store, and the guy's like, yeah, this is never coming back. RIP, please buy a new one. So I did, and I found that I had only saved uh, work from the past year on my in my cloud. So I had lost pretty much everything um, else that I had written over, I don't know, a decade. And I also found that I was not upset about it. And here's why. Because in my heart, I knew I was never going back to those books. Because I am a much different writer now than I was when I wrote those books that didn't sell. And by didn't sell, I mean like I might have spent a couple years on them. My agent and I went through them together. They went on submission to editors. They may have gotten really close to selling, and then somebody said no. Um, they went on multiple rounds of submissions, and these are this is like, I think, three or four books, maybe even more. So, um, which is obviously heartbreaking, right? You spend a lot of time planning and, and dreaming about it, but I also never plan to go back to them. Uh, once it's done for me, it's done. And and I, like I was telling Patrick before this started, the book that I recently finished, I pulled pieces from all the things that I had written that didn't sell and put them in this new book, but I will never go back to a finished product to revise it again. Because every book you write, you change as a person and as a writer. Um, and then you will read your old things and be like, I don't even, what was I thinking kind of thing. <laughs> that is ridiculous. Uh, stuff that you couldn't see before you'll see. And then what was the other part of this question that I was supposed self to Self-publishing. Yeah, oh, okay. self-publishing. Well, and how is it viewed in the industry? Yeah, so I also, a Map for Wild Hearts is self-published. And my reasoning for that 
that's my creative guidebook. Um, is I wrote that book. I wrote a proposal for it. I had it professionally edited. Um, my agent loved it and went on submission. It got to acquisitions six times. Wow. <laughs> so, six times. <laughs> yeah, six right. times is where somebody reads it, <laughs> loves it, but, and then they go through second reads, and the marketing department reads it, and then they have to sit around and decide if they're going to buy this book. Um, and it did not get sold all six times because the marketing department was like, I don't know how to sell this kind of thing because it's a hybrid. It's like part story, part memoir, part creative visualization and prompting, and it's a different breed of book. So um, I decided that that was not a good enough reason for me not to publish it. Uh, nobody told me that it wasn't, it, there was something logically wrong with it, that it didn't make sense. So I self-published it. I had a professional you know, designer. I did the whole thing. I did marketing. It's sold at bookstores. I did a signing with Amy. And um, I, I highly recommend it if you, if you do it the right way, if you put in the time to really edit, have a professional editor look at it, spend a lot of time you know, getting critique and feedback and really position it in the right way, I think it, it's valuable and worth it. Uh, the reason why self-publishing gets a bad rap is because sometimes people just write a crappy draft and throw it up on the internet and then, and then readers will find it and be like, wow, this, this sucks, this is terrible. But there are really great self-published books that books out there too. In the industry, it, it's been traditionally frowned upon, especially like I'm considered a hybrid author because I have self-published book and a traditionally published book. Um, because any book that you publish, an uh, editor or publishing house can type up your name and see where you, how many copies of something you've sold before they decide to buy something else. But I really think that that is changing as well. I feel like People are more open to self-publishing. More traditionally successful authors are self-publishing now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. Anybody else want to hop in on that? What you think of self-publishing? Because I don't know. That's my opinion. But no, I agree. Um, it really depends on the time it, you put into it. Is what you're, it's what you're going to get out of it, basically. Um, as, as far as how publishing sees it, yeah, definitely, it, it's much more acceptable now than it was even five or ten years ago. Um, I was highly, highly, highly encouraged not to self-publish, um, but that was also 10 years ago, and uh, the, the e-book industry especially has changed the name of the game for that one. Mm -hmm. yeah, and um, honestly, you're going to get more money if you self-publish, but the trade-off to that is you're not going to have the marketing behind it that you Just would with a traditional, and you, mm -hmm. you won't have a big-name publisher um, behind you either. So it, it is a trade-off, um, but it really depends on you know, what your book needs. Mm -hmm. So to that point, it's, it's clear that this is very much a business, right, and how we can sell a book. So it's, it's beyond just writing, and to your point, Amy, that it's your creative outlet. Yeah. Eric, a question for you. In your, in your novel, Teach Me to Forget, you talk, tackle a very tough subject of teenage suicide. Um, and thinking about that from a business perspective, one, how do you think about tackling a really tough topic? And then two, what is the impact that you've received from your readers on, on tackling such a tough topic? So um, what I wasn't prepared for with writing about a tough topic like teen suicide is how do you market that? And so uh, I haven't really been able to answer that yet. I mean, I think in a lot of ways you could, you know, capitalize on situations that happen, but I don't want to do that. that. That's just not who I am, and it's not the type of author that I am. And so a lot of it's been word of mouth. Um, I think this particular book, I call it the little book that could, because it started with a smaller publisher that got bought by Simon & Schuster, and then they decided to do a paperback and change the cover, make it almost like a completely different book. And that's really done well for this book, so I was really grateful for that. Um, however, there's no... The marketing is left up to me. And so um, one thing that has been, uh, that was a really big part of, of marketing this book was connecting with other authors who also write harder subjects, like Kathleen Glasgow. And um, she gave me the blurb for the front of the book. And she wrote, um, oh my God. <laughs> I just, Girl in Pieces. And then she has her new one. Um, how to make friends with the dark. And so um, she would add like my bookmarks when she would get requests from libraries and stuff. So it's, it's really about kind of connecting with other authors as well as 
that way it's, it's an authentic communication as opposed to saying hashtag mental health, you know, I mean, it, 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 it is difficult. <laughs> but for me, it wasn't about, um, it wasn't about that. It was about getting it in, in teens' hands so that the message would be spread, so the dialogue would start about a topic like that. And actually, I, uh, my goddaughter, who um, just turned 13, her mom finally gave her permission to read it. She said she read it in two days. And I said, you know, ask me questions about it. And she said she was ready because she came home from school and was asking questions about it. And so um, that's the type of thing. That's the reason I write books like that. And that's the reason I write it all. And so um, the second part of your question was about what is yes, the impact on the yep. readers on tackling such a tough So um, I've had a, um, a decent amount of teenagers reach out to me and tell me thank you, um, and and say they tell me their stories. I've had adults too; it's not just teenagers. And um, I had a couple of readers say that they have more empathy for people going through that, which is like the best gift that you could get for writing a story that's difficult like that. And so um, it's, been, it's been really positive. And I think, um, I think it's an important topic, and I think it should be continued to be talked about in, in open forums, and I hope that it's allowing parents and their teens and even, you know, tweens to discuss this important topic. Because if they're old enough to do it, they, they're old enough to... But I think <laughs> what I've learned from you, and, and as a room of prospective authors, what I can tell you is learn from people who have walked the walk. And I've, I've learned from this panel so much, but Patrick and uh, Erica, when you talk about writing about really difficult topics, the need for sensitivity readers, the needs to be able to have that outside counsel and opinions. Mm -hmm. That's why I asked you that question, because I think, to your point, some of these topics still resonate a decade later. Uh, and it's really important to be able to, to say, you know, it, one, own voices in publishing is a new movement, right? It's really important to tell these stories. Um, but at the same time, you know, creativity comes from many different angles and just be sure to do your homework and have yeah. those. And in terms of the sensitivity reader, it gets the whole thing gets knocked a lot. Like you're being like your voice is being suppressed and your story is being messed with. But um but in my experience, like it, it just meant I ended up with a much better book. It was like not only was it more like right and more sensitive, but because but it just was way better after she after she um did her critique of it, yep. and I wrote based on the critique. It's, it's just, it, it was just better. I needed to hear from her, and she was amazing. I actually won't write a book without a sensitivity reader because I'm filling my world with diverse voices. And so for me, especially, even if the protagonist is, is still someone of my um, heritage and even a mental illness, I'm still going to have someone else read it who is of that, uh, who can tell me, um, just make it a better book, basically. And um, I think it's super important. Yeah. So even if, you, even if you're writing about just a regular subject, I still think I recommend it. Also, I just want to be super clear. Own Voices isn't new. Like, there have been people doing this work for decades. It's just gotten some traction because we Correct. have social Sorry. media and stuff. Yeah. No, it's a, that's a very <laughs> and valid we we're more and and yes. yeah. right. We're more responsible now, I think, than right. we ever have been because we're more aware of, of stories of that, diversity yes, within stories mm -hmm. before it's like, write stories. whatever you want and, you know, and now it's like, write, but have, you know, make sure it's respectful, make sure that you're doing your research, all of that. And then if you should be the one to tell that story, because let's Absolutely. face it, there's only so many books that get published per year, yeah. right? And as white writers, we get, you know, a little bit privileged. privileged and we get a little, we get more chances, I would say. So you have to really consider, should I tell this story? Should I take this space? Because you are taking somebody's space when you yeah. write that story, because there are only so many books that get published per year. Yep. Uh, it's just something Is that to my consider. story to tell, right? right? Mm -hmm. 
So you talk about tone. Um, Amy, question for you, because I know in your bio you, you have released series that are both young adult and middle grade. How do you determine when you start off on an idea that this is going to be middle grade versus young adult versus perhaps you also write adult? And then what do you think about in that creative process and how, does, how do they differ when you're creating? So children's books especially are broken up in, by age group. Um, you have your YA, which is of course 14 and up, so teenagers. Um, you have your middle grade, which uh, is usually 8 to 12 or 8 to 13 years old. Um, and then I think you have chapter books and early chapter books and picture books and all the way down. Um, and the way I really figure it out is I look at the story as a whole. And um, I try to figure out, okay, is this going to have a lot of um, adult themes, for instance? Is this going to be something that I would expect a teenager to be dealing with? Is there a safety net in the form of parents um, or adults around that could help the, the, the protagonist in a way? Um, but the main, the main thing that determines what age group a book is is, um, is the age of the protagonist. So, um, for instance, I'm writing a series now where um, the protagonist has to be 13 years old um, at the very most because it's a middle grade book. So it's for age 12 year olds. Um, and the general consensus or the general feeling is that children won't read down. So they won't read about kids who are younger than them in general. Of course, there's always going to be exceptions. Um, but they will read about kids who are older than them. Uh, so that's why you see a lot of YA um, about, uh, about young adults, about 18-year-olds. 18, um, 18 um, you're probably not going to get many 18-year-olds, um, especially those who are in college. Um, reading that book, but you will get uh, high school age kids. Um, and of course, young adults specifically, uh, to correct myself here, is uh, very much read widely by adults. I think more than 50% of yeah. the audience for young adults is actual adults. Um, but college age, for some reason, a lot of college age will, for some reason, <laughs> they're busy with classes. <laughs> they yeah, don't well, <laughs> and other stuff. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> Um, they tend not to read YA. It's usually college grads versus high school. Um, so yeah, it's very much protagonist age okay. and the themes of the story. Um, transitioning, Andrea, you've turned <laughs> your writing into a business. You have yeah. uh, retreats and workshops and you teach college courses on the topic. Yeah. How do you think about writing with authenticity? Uh, and then also within those workshops, you talk about using your writing to process all that's happened in your life. How do you think about teaching um, mm. within this space? Like teaching creativity and authenticity as a writer? Being writing with authenticity, or how do you think about guiding? So a, okay. a room, how, how would you, what best advice would you give in that space? OK, well, <laughs> that's a, a hard humble. question. <laughs> <laughs> I know you can handle it as a former teacher. Um, you know, it's, I think there are two modes of writing that I tell everybody about. Creativity and writing in general has been a method and a mode that we have all used to heal for thousands of years, right? And I think that it is necessary for everyone to have some kind of outlet, whether it's gardening or writing or, you know, painting or, frankly, I have a fancy espresso machine and I like to make different drinks. That is my creative outlet that's not writing. I always have them come over and be like, come on, you want a peppermint latte? But off track, but they're very good. The, <laughs> the point is, is that everybody needs something um, to process their emotions in some way. I don't think that everything that you write to process your emotions necessarily needs to be published or needs to be part of your business plan for writing. So I have my own personal writing that I work through in journaling and, um, you know, stories that will never see the light of day or just memories that I want to write about. And, and that is what I use to process. However, when I'm writing for Bustle, I'm selling stuff. When I'm writing books, I'm selling my book. When I'm writing my newsletters, I'm selling my workshops. So all of those, that stuff, I will take seeds of authenticity from my private writing and plant them in that newsletter, in that copywriting, in those books. But it's not necessarily full out info dump, emotional dump on people. Because I think, frankly, if you're a creative person and you want to be a writer, it's your job to, to spread a message that is, I don't necessarily want to say positive and hopeful, but like 
you're building a new world, right? So use your power of creativity to build something bigger and better than what's in existence. Don't use it to spread your own heartache everywhere. So yes, you use the heart seeds of heartache to write the story with authenticity, but you, you don't necessarily need to spread all of your emotional pain everywhere. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, and I, I know this is a, a passion point for you within your yeah. workshops and within teaching, and I know even within the writing community, so many people have learned from you, so those nuggets are important <laughs> to share. Um, Erica, question for you. So in your intro, you're obviously you write with humor and you talk about tweeting, et cetera. Um, and I've heard amongst you people talk about personal brand. How do you think about within the digital space? So I know um, in her day job, she also works in digital marketing. How do you think about personal brand in the age of social media? I think it's super important. I think before you even have anything published that you need to um, grab your username and that is why i'm actually erica m chapman because erica chapman was some real estate person in texas <laughs> on twitter and that was in 2009 and so i built a community in, based on that brand and so my website actually i bought the domains of teach me to forget and also ericachapman.com so if anybody googles me those all get directed to my website. And so I think it's important to think about those business aspects in addition to um, writing. These are very separate things to me, very mm -hmm. separate. Um, writing is very personal and very, I, I don't, I, I put all my heartache <laughs> in it. And I, I don't I'm see just... nothing, it's all in there. But um, <laughs> it's true. And, but the business side is completely different. For me, it's completely different. And so I think it's really important that, not that you would censor yourself, but that you remember that others are watching, others are reading, um, but still be yourself. I mean, I'm a goofball who shares a lot of cat videos. My favorite video is a panda eating a carrot. If you oh my God, that's it. the best. It's the best. It's the video. best. That is my so favorite cute. video. So my brand is really, these are animal videos and I love them. And also like um, mental health awareness for sure. Um, anything that has to do with um, diversity in writing and um, you know, I amplify voices that are um, underrepresented. I think that's important too. And of course, shout out about my friends' books and you know everything else. So when you go to my Twitter or my Facebook, you know what you're going to get. You're not just going to. That's what it's really all about: is branding. Make sure that you know. I've had people go on my page and go, "Hey, the Foo Fighters have a new album." I'm like, I know, you know, because <laughs> they know that that's part of like I'm a huge Foo Fighters fan, mm -hmm. and so. Once you get that part of your brand where people actually think of you before you've thought of it, then you've done your job. So. Okay, so <laughs> I have one final question before we open it up uh, to the crowd. And uh, Patrick, I'll start with you and work okay. back. Um, it's a question for all of you, which is just, what's the best advice you could offer to someone who's looking to write and release a book? <clears throat> um, I, I think if you want to, I think those are two really different things in a certain way. Like, I think the first one can be a really healthy thing. <laughs> the second one may or may not be healthy. Like, writing, writing is creativity, and it's this um, outlet, and it's a place for us to process. And um, getting a book sold and being in the publishing industry is um, adds. It adds something to that because it's really cool to have your book between two hardcovers and in a library and in bookstores and stuff. But it, it also takes away something mm -hmm. from it, which is like the, 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 the innocence and, and um, I don't know, the, the wholesomeness of like the task of just writing. Um, but I think if you, but my advice is like, if you want to do the book part, then make a decision that you're gonna end up with a published book. Like, people do it, and it's like, in other things in life, like, if you wanna um, open a business or whatever, there are like these steps that you take, but I think sometimes people are wishy-washy about the book thing, 
and they think they want to get they they want to get published, but they don't make the decision. So to me, by making the decision to get your book published, it means um, writing every day <laughs> or having a writing schedule. Um, and uh, it means sharing your writing with other people who can help make your writing better. It means um, taking workshops and classes. And um, so, and it means uh, setting goals and deadlines and, and. Um, Andrea's my beta writer, or reader <laughs> right now as we speak. Yeah. So, yes, I would agree. That's awesome, so you've made that decision. I think it, it and um, because I think like, I think I have this thing where I think almost every idea for a book is like a really cool publishable thing at an idea stage. And then it's just a matter of taking those steps to like take it all the way. And for some people, um, that process is a, a year and a half long process. For me, it's it a decade. Eight, <laughs> ten, decade long process. But either way, like the decision at the end is that this is going to get published. And if it doesn't work out, that's not on you, right? You've done all the work to get there, and that's a bummer if it doesn't work out. But um, but you need to just make this decision. I am gonna be get published, so I'm gonna do the things that published authors do. So, so there's no magic to that. A little different. <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay. That is all right. Um, I think you have to have passion for what you're writing, because if you're gonna get up every day, or every other day, or like once a week, or like every few months, like me, then you really need to like what you're writing. And I think separating the publishing part from your writing will do you, it will be beneficial. Um, it is for me, I'm not, I'm not trying to tell you what to do, but for me, I really have to like be passionate about what I'm writing and I can't think about where it's going I, because then it, it curbs what I'm, my first draft is always just gonna be for me. Because, and I think that's that's the advice I would give. Write a first draft for you. Don't worry about the reader at all, because that's how you're really going to get that first authentic draft. And so um, I also think it's important to finish it, because I have like a lot of half-finished novels, which is fine in my opinion. I think that's how you kind of get to a finished one. But if you're thinking about publishing and you want to choose to make that choice, see, we'll segue there then you have to have a finished book. And so um, even if it's crappy, you finished it and you have something to work with. And so I also think it's important that you have others read your stories and uh, because you're your worst critic, but you're also your biggest fan. Yeah. <laughs> so other people can point out you know, inconsistencies mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, so I don't want to take a bunch of other people's, you know, advice. But for me, I really think it's, you really need passion for what you're saying or else it's, why are you doing it, yeah. right? I'm totally on board all with right. all that. Awesome. <laughs> so I'm gonna cheat a little bit. I have three um, and they are quick. Uh, first of all, kind of in the vein of what you guys were talking about, write the book that you would wanna read. Um, that is the, honestly, the best piece of advice I can give. Um, if you don't want to read it, no one else will. Um, but if you do read it, then I guarantee you someone else will want to read that book. Um, and that's kind of how I started. I, I had these ideas in my head when I was a kid, and I went to the bookstore, the library, and looked for these books, and they didn't exist. So I decided to write them instead. Um, second piece of advice is read. Um, I feel like that gets overlooked a little bit, especially you know when you're so focused on writing, and you're like, I don't have time to read, or I don't want to steal someone else's voice, or have you know, have influence from uh, other writers, but that's kind of, it's a little bit silly. Um, I get it, I totally felt the same way for a long time, but the way you fill the creative well and the way you get excited about writing is reading in a lot of ways. Yeah, creativity doesn't happen in a vacuum. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, you have to keep absorbing and read as much as you can in the genre you're writing. Um, and lastly, learn to take critique. That's very, very important. It is so hard to spend months writing, or however long it takes you, months writing a book, and then to hand it to someone and get notes back that say, eh, this isn't nearly as good as you actually think it is. Um, but Which you know, is almost th always the case. Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, no, yeah. no, I've, I've <laughs> been doing this for 12 years now, and I've never, ever, ever, and I've written over 2,000 books, some of which have been published, some of which have been had it, um, that uh, none of them have been perfect at all from the first draft. They all need work, and that's, that's, that's how it is. 
Um, you need to learn to take someone's critique and learn to differentiate between, okay, this person has a really good point, how do I fix it? Versus, okay, maybe this person doesn't quite understand what I'm trying to do with that book. Um, so it is a learning process, um, and you do have to have a thick skin in some ways in publishing while still retaining that thin skin so you can you know, be vulnerable on the page and, and have that emotion there. Um, but yeah, you really do need to learn to take critique um, and constructive critique um, and, and sort of learn how to, how to fix your manuscript with that. Oh, that's a lot of good advice. Um, to piggyback off what you said about critique, I just, to be honest with you, not selling those three to four books was the best thing that ever happened to me for a lot of reasons. One, you know, I'm doing, I realized in that time period that I didn't want to just be a writer. I am a natural teacher, so it's good that I, I branched out that way. But um, in that time period, I had always seen myself as a writer, mostly because other people told me that I was a good writer, right? Your teacher, you know, your dad, everybody that you want praise and love from is like, you're a great writer, you should be a writer. So when you have three or four things that don't get published and you've poured your heart and soul into them, you're like, you kind of lose a little bit of your identity there. And that was good for me because it helped me develop in different ways to really get strong in my own values, what matters to me outside of writing, who I am outside of writing. So now coming back into it, um, you know, I just finished my first young adult draft in three years. But Congrats. thanks. Thank you. That was really good. Stop. Really good. <laughs> um, I'm sure you'll tell me what's wrong with it after you read it, but it's fine. <laughs> so they, but to come back to it with a new perspective, I have much thicker skin because I have I feel like I have worth and value outside of the writing process as well. So, um, you know, like when Amy will eventually tell me all of the things that are wrong <laughs> with my book of it, I, I, it won't hurt. Like it will feel like, all right, I can fix it because I have more confidence now um, and I feel like I'm a much better writer. So I would just say to you, enjoy the process, enjoy other people's critique and really learn to find value outside of the process as well so that when you're in the process you feel good about the critique you get. I think just to add to that a little bit, sorry, yeah. um, you're probably not going to sell your first book. You may not sell your second, third, fourth, or fifth. I wrote over two dozen novels before my first book was published. Um, so you got to love it. Yeah. <laughs> you really have to love doing this. And, and revising. Yeah, and when you do get to the published stage and you're in editing and revising, you're going to read that sucker over and over and over and yeah. over and over again until you want to gouge out your own eyes. <laughs> and it's awful. Um, but you, so you really do have to love what you're doing. Yeah. It's not quick money, guys. <laughs> uh, so thank you all. Thank I you. will thank add you. one last piece of advice that I have learned from all of you, which is find a writing community. Find people that you respect, that you look up to, that you can learn from. So thank you for being that for me. Yeah, uh, thank you for coming today. Um, does anyone have any questions? First, how do you know when you've written something really, really good? Uh, that you want like, you know, take it out there, get feedback, or you know, try and get published. And second, um, like when the first critiques came out of uh, you know, the books here or anything else, how do you react to them? Do you read them? Do you not even worry about it? How does that entire process work? I can. I don't, want, I don't read any anything. I don't go on Goodreads. I don't go on Amazon. I don't go anywhere because for me, my job is done. When the when the book is published, what anybody else says about it is none of my business because I've done my work. Uh, the feedback that I need, I get from my writing community beforehand. So. Uh, and there's a great quote by Brene Brown where she says, like, why are you listening to people who aren't standing in the arena, right? So it, anybody can critique a book, but are you in there writing a book? Then I don't, I don't know. Um, so I, I take my critique partners and my writing communities and my agents voice to heart, but I don't need to hear what everybody on Amazon has to say about it. What was the other question? I forget. Um, how do you know when you really have a good story? You know, I think it's just years of like, you, you build your intuition around it, right? And it's years of reading and reading other people's work and reading your genre and uh, keeping up with the publishing industry and seeing what's out there. I mean, there are things I've written that I've been like, this is, this is good, like it makes sense. Um, it's good enough, but it, it's only once in a while where I write something and I feel like it 
hits all the right marks. Uh, and I think it's just intuition, really, honestly. But maybe you have a better answer than I do. <laughs> if I want to reread that book, then I know it's a good one. Um, honestly, if I get through writing it, then yeah. I'm pretty sure it's a good one. Because <laughs> it's no joke to sit down every day and to to enter this world and try to write these characters. And if they're not good enough, if they're not strong enough um, to hold my attention, then they're not going to be strong enough to hold anybody's attention. So, I read all of it. I have a really thick really? skin. I read every review everywhere. You're one of the only people I know that does yeah. that. Yeah. It doesn't bother me. In fact, when I get down there, <laughs> once they've quoted me and said things, <laughs> I'm like, you know, they have kind of a point. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, how are good you, criticism. How are you yeah. ever going to learn? From your chef's you man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it doesn't bother me. Say what you will. <laughs> I, re I do. I read just about everything, too, and I, I hate it. It's totally self-defeating and ridiculous. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Like, it's so bad. Like, Because you know what? Man. Like, when somebody, I if I, I read a raving, awesome review of something I've written, you know, it's happened a couple times, where the people just, like, <laughs> love your stuff, and I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> so like it doesn't do anything for me, and then I read one that somebody's like, he totally got this wrong, and it sucks, and then I'm like, yeah, they're <laughs> right, they're right. When they're when they're, it's bad, they're right, and when it's good, it's like, okay, yeah. But you're, you're keeping always... all of it out though, even the good. Like there's a lot of good out there, mm -hmm. more good than good. bad. I don't and need it the was, good. Just, I got and my own, that yeah. makes me feel good that I've, you know, <laughs> that's how I can say what they've said if I. If, you know, I'm I know I'm man. I'm a weirdo, but it's okay. Everybody has their own thing. Yeah, yeah. I can't stop. But like I, I, think, <laughs> I just need the checks in the mail. That's all. I can. Yeah. The other answer to your <laughs> question, <laughs> though, you may not know. You may not know if it's good. For me, I pick like a a personal message, and I build a story around it, and I get to the end, and I'm like. All right, I had some moments where I was like feeling something, so let me send it to other people and get their feedback. That's how I kind of know that it's hit the mark. Um, I don't know personally when I read it, because I've got that little inner voice that's like, this is crap, and you know <laughs> that you're not going to go anywhere, and blah, blah, blah. And you know, you got to shut that voice up. And then, so you may not know, but others will tell you, your, your community of writers that you share it with. Yeah. It's also hard to know, because like, I have the, um, it's hard, it's hard to read your own stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and I, in my mind, what I'm reading is that, is this end goal version packed with emotion, packed with thrills and chills. And, um, and the thing I'm reading on the page is a step towards that, but it's not that yet, but I'm reading, I'm reading it like it's this. So, um, so again, that's where the critique partners and the helpers come in. You know what I, I didn't interrupt you. No, not at all. What I do is I, I send it to my Kindle and or Google tablet. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> know your audience. And um, I read it like a reader. So I take it from the computer and I read it like a reader. And then I look at those nuances and say, what, is this like a real book that I'm reading? And that really helps me personally. You can't make the changes. As yeah, you're, you're not you making to, any changes. Yeah. You're not editing because we'll you'll be editing when you read it on your yeah. computer on on your tablet. Um, you your Chromebook. Yeah. Yes. What is it? Yeah, Chromebook. <laughs> <laughs> you. Um, I am a Google girl. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Um, <laughs> you can read it that way as a reader, and that will help you to determine maybe if it's got some legs or not. So. Hi there. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being awesome. here. It's been very informative and yeah, insightful. Thank you for having us. Yeah, uh, yes, so thank you fun. so much. <laughs> is this on, by the way? Can everyone I hear me? I don't know if it's on. Cool. Uh, my question is around the commercial viability uh, of publishing and reconciling that with your actual creative, authentic voice. Um, when it comes down to it, how do, like, for those of you on the panel, how do you balance being able to create a book that can sell well while having an authentic story, while feeling like you're actually telling your own personal truth and writing with that passion. Um, I out there. think I don't think they're mutually exclusive by any means. Um, I think what you're passionate about, you can absolutely create something commercial around that. Um, there's this idea that 
if, if it's not liter literary writing and you're not you know, dealing with tough subjects or all of this, um, it's not literature, <laughs> that's bull. Um, we were actually discussing this last night. Um, no matter how quote unquote fluffy something might seem or how you know, cartoony or um, middle grain you know, about kids changing into animals, which is one of my series, um, there are always going to be threads of um, your emotional truth in there. Because that's just who you are as a person, and that's who you are with your voice. Um, and just because people want to read it does not mean it's not literary or not literature, if, if that makes sense. Um, and I do think it is, it's an instinct, and, and it's something you very much, you, you can absolutely learn. Um, I may want to write one thing, but I know that um, a, as I'm picturing it, it may not fit uh, the three-act structure, for instance, um, of a screenplay. But you can make anything commercial. You can really turn anything into a story as long as you have the tools, as long as you've done the research and, and learned how. Um, writing is something you really, and storytelling specifically, is something you do need to learn. But once you know the basics, anything can be commercial. It's true. If you look at the examples of even like, movies that are popular they're not all of them are commercial like marriage story that wasn't really it was it was a story about two people going through no spoilers but and divorce and um <laughs> must force yeah it's really good so that you wouldn't you wouldn't look at that and go wow that's a really commercial story i think people are really good it you really don't know until it gets out and you get you know some sometimes you just you have to tell the story that's inside of you and send it out to the world yeah. and hope for the best. Oh, well, I I the mic. Apparently I have the mic, so I have the power. <laughs> um, you talk about finding your community. So could you give us some advice on finding your writing community and also how do you know you found the right community? Because I think there's a very oh big gosh. difference between finding people who will tell you they love your work versus finding people who will help you make your work better. Yes. Well, Hi. it works like a friendship. You know, these are people that you, um, there has to be a, an amount of trust that you have in them. Um, I think, so I first met some people on Twitter back, uh, it was like 2009 or something, and there was a, a large group of us that got very close, and only a couple of us are still friends. So it really depends on, I think finding a local group is a good idea too. Um, come to things like this so you can meet other writers like that and um, go to one of Andrea's I was reads. just gonna I was just gonna say that Andrea Second actually that. is the you know we all went to her retreat Patrick you gotta go then. yeah Patrick now. Patrick um, <laughs> but find my community yeah <laughs> so really having other writers introduce you to other people and you know just like making friends it's kind of similar to that and then um, there's an online element to that. If you if you go on certain hashtags like am writing or hashtag writing community, there's a lot of writers that are writing the same type of story that you're writing. And you could just strike up a conversation with them and then they may know people that know people. Maybe they're already in a Facebook group and you can that's how you can kind of join. So And if you're writing for kids from YA all the way on down um, or illustrating um, oh. the society of uh, children's book writers and illustrators is a shortcut to, to all of this. Mm -hmm. But I do think it's important to not necessarily just jump right in, like to like read my stuff or I'll read your stuff because you you can get connected with somebody who's just like, oh, this is not a good fit. This just doesn't feel right to me. And, and that's kind of a side getting you off the track of what you're trying to do. So it's good to hang out and meet a lot of people um, it's also before you trial decide and to error jump too. into a It really is. Yeah. What's that? It it's is kind trial of trial and error, error too for a little bit. Right, yeah, yeah. that's true. Because yeah. you could, I've stayed friends with people that don't read my manuscripts because yeah. I was fine. like, eh, yeah. I'm, I'm no, good, that's totally we'll fine. friends. Yeah, I feel like mm -hmm. there's this, this idea that if you're friends with a writer, you absolutely have to read their manuscript right. and they have to read yours. <laughs> right. No, mm -mm. not even no. a little bit. Um, I have friends where we write completely different genres and I just don't read their genre. But we're still friends, we're still part of the same writing community, we support each other 100%. Which is still equally important, I would argue. Yeah. You yeah. need writer friends yeah. who won't read your work as well. Like, just people to talk to on a day-to-day -day basis about the process, about 
being in the query trenches or submission hell or any of the other places you go when you do this job. <laughs> um, just so as, many awful places. There's so many, but great places too, yes. guys. Um, you know, it's not awful. <laughs> and Amy and I have been friends for like four, four or five years, and we just now, like, I still have not read any of Amy's work. My reasoning is twisted because I'm afraid I won't like it and then it'll like, you know, whatever. <laughs> but we just started now passing works in progress back and forth. So it's just, it's trial and error. It's getting to know people. It's networking. It's finding your online community and then hopefully your in-person community. A lot of libraries have writing groups. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a good chance you'll read somebody's stuff. Like maybe you both write adult romance or adult thrillers. And then you realize you totally do not gel. And that's okay. It's just mm -hmm. kind of... Just, you can yeah. still be friends. Yeah, yeah. right, exactly. Yeah. We probably have time for one okay. more. Curious about each of your writing processes. Like, what does your day look like, or month, I don't know, um, overall? And like, how do you get in the right space to write? Um, so, oh my gosh. First of all, I want to be clear, it changes from book to book and process to process. And But in general, I'm an early riser. I'm up before I have two kids, school age kids, and as soon as they wake up, there's just no getting anything done. So I'm up like five or six, and I that's when I get um, it's not even good writing because I'm tired, but just like that's where I can tap into the heart stuff where I'm still tired enough to not put the filter up. And then I get them to school, and then I work for Bustle during the day. I write from home, so I usually do that stuff during the day. And then I, I head back to my computer at night after they go to bed and do a little more work. Um, I do have some tricks, though. So when I'm working on a draft, I pick out a candle for each draft that smells like it. And I light it when I'm working on that draft so that it's like your body, awesome. your body's getting like, oh, yes, it's, this candle is deep, dark forest. It's time to work on this black bear book. You know what I mean? Like, it kind of just reminds you that it's time. And it makes it a little ritual, right? You light your candle, put on some music, get started. It's almost like... I, stop it. <laughs> so yeah, I, that's like my trick to, to tell my brain it's time to do this work, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can't really wait for inspiration, especially when you're a full-time writer like me. You got to sit down and do it every day. Um, I don't really. I just need to be fed. I can't write on an empty stomach. Um, I tend to write at night. Um, I've been trying to make myself write during the day, but that honestly, sometimes it's hit or miss. Um, I'm j kind of like you with the early morning thing. With me, late at night, I'm tired and I can just, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not, I'm not sitting there editing myself as I go, which is a huge thing um, to really hit the flow. Um, and uh, I don't, I, it, it also changes every single book. Like, I, I get this question a lot. I don't know, man. Sometimes I write at my dining room table from noon to four. Sometimes I write in bed from midnight to four. <laughs> like, it really depends. You um, need some structure and accountability. Like we will meet online yeah. in the evenings to like sprint together. So I'd be like, did you write today? Did you write today? You get a little aggressive with each other <laughs> so that it, so that you have some accountability too. Yeah. I, oh, oh I'm sorry. sorry. Oh, I, I, <laughs> One more thing. <laughs> I also set timers. So if I'm struggling, if I'm really struggling to get into a book and like get focused, I will set a timer and be like, okay, for the next 10 minutes, I'm just going to write. Um, or the next, you know, if I'm feeling a bit more into it, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, until I, I'm, I'm into it and I, can really, I don't need the timer anymore to tell me what to do. So that helps a lot. <laughs> I'm completely opposite than both of them. <laughs> um, I know, shocking, isn't it? Um, I don't write every day. I don't even write. I haven't written in months. So it just depends. It really, yeah. I've been, I've had other stuff going on. I have to have everything else. To be of. fair, you do have a book out for submission. I do. It's yeah. not like, so there is. in the process. Congrats. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> there is one I finished and it's for sale. So um, I do have that happening. But, and that's usually, um, for me, I have to have a motivation of some sort. Uh, and, I, I haven't had a lot. So I'm waiting for that that moment of inspiration, which I know you said you can't have, which is why I haven't written in a few months. Um, <laughs> Gotta just do it, man. I know. I um, Get on our online chats. I know. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm a very lone writer. I typically <laughs> don't, um, and I don't, I don't know that I recommend it. For me, once I get that trigger, though, I write very quickly. It's done in like a month. And then I have my draft. And then I revise. Mm -hmm. It is. So I'm a very 
binge writer. You know, it's not every yeah. day. So you may not want to write it. I don't want to write every day. It's too much. I'm but a binge when, writer too, and I also write every yes. day. Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> this is this is what burnout looks like, people. <laughs> You're also extremely pro prolific. Like most people, yeah, don't write she as writes much a lot. Too, like yeah. I'm. This would have been or er, this. I've had two. The one that got published, and then I had the one that's for sale, and then this would be like three that I, in the past two or three years. So it's like a book a year. So I still have some time. It's only February, right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so it just varies on what you're comfortable with. And so um, that is a learning for me, and it's something I'm working on. So <laughs> see, you're not always. <laughs> You know, perfect. Yeah. Final game. thoughts, Patrick. Yes, yeah. I would be a nighttime writer, but I have kids who get up really early in the morning. It just doesn't work, so I get up even earlier than they do and mm -hmm. write for a couple hours, get them off to school, and kind of not doing other work right now. Um, seeking writing work, if there's anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but I, so I'm really trying to finish a draft of a of a book, and so. I'll drop the boys off and go straight to the library. I uh, am paying for this Freedom app. Oh, yeah. And I'm knocked off the internet for probably 14, 15, 16 hours of the day. And it's helping my <laughs> mental health and it's helping my writing tremendously. Aren't so, you um, afraid you're going to miss something? <laughs> I am not really fearing I'm going to miss All something. Right. <laughs> I have no online presence or platform. Um, because I just feel like I would screw that up. Um, so, no, nah, I just like, I don't know, it just doesn't, that aspect doesn't work for me. Okay. Um, you don't, don't, there's some agents who wouldn't take me on no, because of that. No, you don't have but, to have it. But um, anyway. No, and that's yeah. the thing, yeah. like, you don't need one, so. Well, thank you again for joining us. I, and thank you for staying a few minutes over. We, we started late today, so I appreciate it.